the flag over Highbury, the home of Arsenal, with its traditions, its history, its style, its championships. Just think of the men who put their dazzling talents on show in this great arena. And now George Graham, the present manager, has the task, and what a task it is, of picking the 11 best individuals to have worn those famous red and white shirts, from the glittering 30s right through to the present championship side. Bradford. Oh, what a good shot! The great goal! John Radford scores his second! And Brady linking up well. Stapleton's up there. McDonald's looking for it too. Oh, what a goal! Time to measure his cross. And Fox is there! Oh, a superb save! By Bob Wilson from Billy Fox. to me, Hudson with a header, McDonald with a header! Kennedy, good header, George, oh my word! Spink Fiss, only straight to Rowcastle, the chance is on! The goal is there for David Rowcastle! Well obviously Arsenal with a lot of tradition, uh, and going back, it was one of the first great sides uh, in the 30s, and they actually stayed there for a decade. The difficulty really is to sort of try to pick those players without actually seeing them. But uh, the reputation and the trophies they won would indicate there were a lot of top, top quality players in those 30 years. Uh, and that's the main difficulty I've found uh, picking the best ever Arsenal team, would be to, sort of to pick players in reputation rather than having seen them. And obviously, that this Arsenal image that's uh, throughout football, uh, the feeling that uh, old players and present players have for the club uh, and are Arsenal orientated, I think that's got to come through in my selection. So these are the contenders for the two striking positions. The men to score the goals in this greatest ever Arsenal eleven, from Ted Drake in the 30s, Reg Lewis, Ray Kennedy and John Radford, through to Charlie George, Frank Stapleton and Malcolm McDonald, and then through to the present day side, to Alan Smith. Ted Drake, again going back to the famous 30s era. Strong, brave, tremendous goal scorer. And was probably famous for getting his seven goals against Aston Villa at Villa Park. That was a tremendous achievement, scoring so many goals in one game. And was also part, the main part, of the, the England side which played at Highbury against Italy, which Arsenal formed the majority of the team. With Ted's fantastic goal-scoring record and other attributes, what would he be worth in the market today? Jumping from the 30s into the 40s, Ronnie Rook, who played centre-forward in the 1948 Championship side, had a tremendous goal-scoring rate, scoring 67 times in 87 games. Wonderful scoring at any level. Then we had Reg Lewis, famous for his two goals in the cup final against Liverpool. And also Doug Lishman, who scored 125 goals in 226 games and also picked up some medals along the way. Cliff Holton, another tall, strong centre forward. We now move into the 60s with Joe Baker. Fast centre forward, tremendous goal scoring rate and had made a big reputation both in Scotland and Italy before moving to Highbury. Going on to the 70s, the famous 70-71 team again with a wonderful partnership of Ray Kennedy and John Radford. Both of them Tremendous understanding, he played a big part in Arsenal winning the, not only the championship, but the FA Cup in the same season. Radford. Kennedy on the far post, getting ahead to it, and it's there! Ray Kennedy! Beautiful play there by Armstrong. Oh, and a dummy there, let's Kennedy in! Oh, a fine goal by Kennedy! 
Radford. George. And now Kennedy. Claims for offside, but not given. And a second goal by Ray Kennedy. Crossed again there towards Radford. Yes! George Graham. That's aimed towards Radford. Up he goes! Oh, Radford! My goodness, what a leap! Good run there by Graham, and he's picked one for Kennedy! Oh, and surely he will score Radford! After Kennedy made such a meal of it, with Liverpool claiming offside. And now Radford's story was offside, but it was all right. Now Radford. And that is going to be number two. John Radford. Another outstanding striker with some great goals for Arsenal was the crowd's favourite and the North Bank's favourite, Charlie George. Tremendous talented player. He should have been able to win many caps for England. Charlie George, who often broke the midfield, showing his tremendous power of long range shooting. Graham. Bradford, Charlie George. Bradford. Oh, Charlie George, you can hit him. Oh, a great goal! Charlie George! Oh, what a fabulous goal by George! We've seen his famous goal in the cup final, but he also scored many other ones from long range distances. Kennedy, good header. George. Oh, my word! Another great striking partnership which developed in the late 70s was Malcolm McDonald and Frank Stapleton. Complemented one another very well. With Frank, the youngster just got on the team, working very hard, tremendous in the air. And Stapleton again is on the far side, got the header in! Stapleton's goal! There's the little cross coming in, and that's number two by Stapleton! It's a free kick now, and here's Brady with it. The little chip in there towards Staple, and there's the header, and the goal! Frank in the team as a youngster, and was a wonderful foil for Malcolm. Tremendous partnership together with Frank's good power in the air. And that's a good-looking cross there towards Staple, and again, up he goes, in towards McDonald, number two! Well, they talked a few years ago of Radford and Kennedy, and McDonald and Stapleton are that equivalent partnership in the Arsenal of 1977. Malcolm was a typical extrovert, um, always in the papers, uh, but to be fair to him, uh, he scored some tremendous goals. Um, his biggest asset was his, his speed over 10 yards and a great left foot, and he could do very, very, very well in the air for such a small guy. Oh, a lovely touch now for Ross. encouraged by the goal and a lovely ball from Rice for McDonald and Sheffield United sliced the part. Alan Sunderland who scored the famous goal in the 3-2 win over Manchester United in the FA Cup final. It was a fairy tale ending to a very ordinary game. Well wait a moment, it's there by Sunderland and they're back in the lead again and they're off the bench once more. What an amazing cup final! Liam Brady with a little chip going in there, and a near post header beautifully taken by Sunderland to make it 3-1. Charlie Nicholas, another favourite of the North Bank, and a very similar mould to Charlie George. Immensely talented, but probably didn't produce his best play that indicated you know, in the left centre. Looking find uh, Nicholas again, he might get it on the rebound, it's a goal! A fine one by Nicholas! It's Davis, into the wall, might even have hit Niall Quinn. Back from Sansom, Anderson's onside, Adams, here's Nicholas! From the post, Nicholas again! It's his goal! Here's Sansom. Grove still fresh, of course, 
and away from Gillespie. Possibilities here for Arsenal and for Nicolas. It's 2-1. And the first Littlewoods Cup goes to Arsenal. Charlie Nicholas, is he going through them all, he is, he's going past the keeper too, and he scored! They're also on the same side, it was Tony Woodcock and Paul Mariner. Probably had seen the best days with other clubs, but did very well for Arsenal in the short term, and also had good international careers. Mariner, nice little flick on, good touch by Woodcock, a beautiful touch by Charlie Nicholas and Woodcock on his way, a brilliant goal for Arsenal, 3-1. Woodcock, Sunderland outside him, Woodcock and Robson advancing into that area, and Woodcock, what a brilliant goal. A lovely cross played in, and what about that for a bit of skill? In off the post, beating Grew to the wide. Sanson with the... Oh, and it goes in, oh, fair enough. Arsenal in the lead. Paul Mariner gets the first goal of the new season. And there was nothing Nitreski could do about that. Now up to the present side, and of course Alan Smith, who had a purple season and will win the championship. Richardson again. Winterburn to Rowcastle. Winterburn continued the run. The left foot cross coming in. Smith! Rowcastle, Alan Smith waiting in the centre with Marwood. Michael Thomas lurking on the edge of the area. Smith is there. Alan Smith has scored. Quickly set forward again, and Dixon died, but Smith has scored. So Alan Smith really got his reward then. Rowcastle playing it in. Smith getting in there. Arsenal level. Dixon. Merson trying a little touch. Smith playing it back into the path of Merson. Might come for Smith again. It's 1-1. And Alan Smith gets his 14th goal of the season. Smith. Arsenal lead 2-0. Marwood. Arsenal unabashed. Marwood, Oh, Merson, and Smith. Justice is done. Smith. What a great effort. Oh, my word, what a goal. A goal of sheer quality by Alan Smith. It wasn't even a half chance. Not only did Alan score important goals and finish up top goal scorer, but scored the one that set us on to the championship victory at Anfield with a tremendous head. To burn and Richardson behind it. Adams has made a darting little run in there. And Smith! A very difficult decision. But um, looking at some of them, um, probably played with other clubs and then joined Arsenal, I would look at two of Arsenal men, what I term Arsenal men, Ted Drake and John Radford. So Ted Drake gets a striking place, a hero from the 1930s, and I'm sure that'll be a popular choice with all the older Arsenal fans. And his partner? Well, it's John Radford, that Arsenal man from 1963 to 1976. What a great reign that was. Next, we come to the shortlist of Arsenal goalkeepers. Frank Moss from before the war, George Swindon, Jack Kelsey, Bob Wilson, Pat Jennings, and the present-day keeper, John Lukic. Frank Moss must come into contention because he was in the side that first won trophies for Arsenal 
1930. Uh, that was the first year uh, Arsenal won the, the FA Cup and the first major trophy they won. So obviously for the next decade he was the, the mainstay in goals and the mainstay of the defence. After Frank Moss, uh, George Swindon took over. George not only was a great goalkeeper and won championship medals uh, with Arsenal, he also went on to manage the club. So obviously being in a championship side, uh, George would actually come into contention as well. Jack Kelsey took over from uh, George Swindon then and Jack went on to have a fantastic career, not only with Arsenal, but also in the national side playing for Wales. So obviously Jack, who stayed at the club a long, long time in goals, uh, he is another one uh, in contention for getting the best side. The nice thing about Jack is his love for uh, the club. And he's actually still working at the club, so he's been here for many, many years. And again, this Arsenal um, thing goes through and through, players here who have played in the past and the present side too. Bob Wilson uh, came into the side uh, in the late 60s and was a mainstay uh, without question of uh, the defence when we won the, the double in 1970-71. Um, Bob, I, I would say, was one of our best players in that season and probably never didn't get the credit he deserved. So Bob would be in the goalkeeping uh, situation with, uh, to get the best place there. Time to measure his cross. And Bonds is there! Oh, a superb save! By Bob Wilson from Billy Bonds. And again, all the Sunderland supporters behind that Arsenal goal. Giving their team all the encouragement. Horseman again, and a shot! Oh, and a wonderful save by Wilson! Bob, very excitable. A great trainer. Loved training very hard on the day before a match. Used to always work with uh, Don Howe. Uh, in a sand pit. Uh, it was quite funny, we actually had to get a sand pit uh, just beside, um, beside the, the, the goals uh, at Highbury. And uh, Bob used to work ever so hard there on a Friday, Friday morning. We used to all finish having a five-a-side in the indoor gymnasium. Uh, but Bob was a little bit excitable, uh, but had, had a tremendous season. And we still have a joke about it when we won the double. But uh, one of the few mistakes he made was Steve Highway actually scored the goal and Bob anticipated the cross. But at the end of the day, we went on to win the cup, so it was all forgotten about it. We still joke about it today. 1-2, and he couldn't get the shot in Kaiser now. Kaiser looking for the shot to beat Wilson, and Wilson a wonderful save. Always a handful for Nelson, he's got it across again on the far side, and Wilson there beating away Cruyff's header. A nasty looking one, and Arsenal getting well back there in the defence, and Kaiser! Simpson, oh, the pass there to Cruyff! The last seconds of the game, a dipping cross there, and Wilson! Then Pat Jennings, uh, without doubt one of the best goalkeepers in the world. But Pat, I would say, earned uh, his reputation as a sports player. Uh, and even though uh, he came to Arsenal when he was supposed to have been finished, he had a few outstanding seasons here at Highbury. Uh, but I would always say that Pat would be remembered as a Spurs goalkeeper and probably had his best days and obviously uh, a longer, longer spell with Tottenham and at Arsenal. But without doubt, one of the best goalkeepers in the country. Royal going for this one and getting up well. Newton going in, ball. Oh, a magnificent save. Played there now for Colin Harvey. Oh, and another fine save. Ball with the free kick. And Jennings, oh, forced to push that one over. Oh, another far side. Cormac. Oh, a superb save. A magnificent save by Jennings. Played back for best. To blast one. Oh, great work there by Jennings. Now oh, Bailey. Hit well and save well. Daly coming in. Barney coming in and save brilliantly. John Richards with a shot and a deflection and Pat Jennings is in trouble. No, he's not. There's Hibbitt with a shot and there's Jennings again. Hit towards Bailey. On the volley. Oh, and what a save again. Spurs, one or two crises yet to face, I fancy, as Mills plays that one in towards Beattie. The header's there. The header's right there. Beattie. Oh, and somehow Jennings saved it. How on earth did the man do it? with the right foot onto Hansen's head and Jennings. When I first came to the club, uh, John Lukic, uh, 
it was just another goalkeeper. And I gave him an opportunity, tightened up the defence, and John's played his part very much uh, in the last three years. Uh, and I would say he's one of the best short stoppers in the country. Um, he's never let us down. He's now got a uh, championship medal to go along with his uh, Lucky Woods Cup medal. And the only thing that's lacking is the FA Cup. Brian McClare for 2 0, and John Lukic incredibly saves the penalty. It's his third penalty save on this ground. Sees that under pressure from Harford, and Harford's got away from him. Brian Steen's waiting in the middle. Can Harford get to that one? Crossed in by him. Brilliant piece of goalkeeping by Lukic from the header from Brian Steen, and Luton within a whisker of being two ahead. Tremendous piece of goalkeeping there by Lukic. That six-foot frame of his stretched to the very last inch. Well, not having seen uh, Frank Moss, I uh, haven't seen quite a few clips uh, of Jack Kelsey. Having played against uh, Jennings uh, and played with Bob Wilson and then managed John Lukic, uh, I think I'll plump for Jack Kelsey, who really has got, not only got a great love for Arsenal, but uh, I'm sure all the older Arsenal fans have got a great love for Jack. A surprise then for many that Pat Jennings and Bob Wilson are overlooked. It's Jack Kelsey who gets the place. Now the centre-backs in this greatest ever Arsenal team, Herbie Roberts, Big Leslie Compton, Bernard Joy, Frank McClintock, Peter Simpson, David O'Leary and the present captain, Tony Adams. Herbie Roberts, going back to the 30s again, was a big stopper centre-half in the Chapman era. Obviously he's got to be included in the centre-halves. Because of the championships they won and also the FA Cup successes they had too. Leslie Compton then started making a name for himself uh, in the 40s and the early 50s and he will be probably the best remembered for being the oldest player ever capped by England when he was 38 years of age. Didn't see too much of Leslie, I've seen a few clips of him. Big, strong, outstanding in the air, lacked a bit of mobility, but was very, very positive in what he did. Bernard Joy, another name from the 30s, had a tremendous career as an amateur international and also played the 1936 Olympic team. He made a tremendous transition from amateur to professional and did very, very well for Arsenal. Going back once again to the 1970-71 team, uh, Peter Simpson. Very underrated player uh, throughout the country, but not, underrate, not, not underrated at Highbury. He formed a tremendous partnership with Frank McClintock. Frank was the extrovert the great captain, the leader. But Peter was a quiet one, tidying up, with an absolute magical left foot. Always did enough, Peter. Uh, never break sweat. Very similar to myself. And uh, was very well thought of by the fans, not only by the fans, but the people and players at Highbury. Uh, Peter, for his class, would definitely be in contention for one of the centre-back spots. Clipped up for George, headed away by Hemsley, it's Kelly to pick it up and put it back to Simpson. Simpson teeing up for a shot, and deflected all ground, but no, George finishes it off. It was Peter Simpson's low shot from outside the penalty area, deflected a little en route, but brought Jim Brown to full stretch. And it's Charlie George back in the side because John Radford has flu, who puts Arsenal one up. Frank McClintock. Another one from the 1970-71 team. Probably one of the great captains uh, for Arsenal alongside the Mercers of this world. Great leader, uh, wonderful attitude, tremendous competitor, and without doubt would definitely be in contention for the centre-back spot. Frank had been to Wembley so many times, uh, not only in the FA Cup, but also the League Cup, uh, without ever being a winner. And when we actually beat Liverpool, uh, I think more people were pleased for Frank uh, as much as uh, being pleased for Arsenal. It was nice to see him at last, with all his Wembley failures, to get uh, to pick up the FA Cup and to complete the double. The 1971 Cup final, 
was the most relaxed uh, game as far as I was concerned because we'd already won the championship the previous Monday. I always remember Don Howe saying to us, we've done the hard thing, we've won the championship. Now go out and enjoy yourself at Wembley. Uh, that's what I certainly did. And uh, there was no pressure on us at all. And I think we all wanted to, to, to do a little bit special, especially for Frank. Uh, being there so many times on the losing side, I think we all wanted to see Frank walk up those steps and hold the trophy up high. Hughes to Thompson, and away on the left is Highway. Still Highway, dangerous indeed! Kennedy, George and Kennedy again, Bradford back over his head, Kelly is right in there playing much more as a striker in this extra time and it's there, George Graham, it's George Graham who got the touch and makes it 1-1, Bradford, Charlie George, Bradford, Oh, Charlie George, you can hit him. Oh, a great goal! Charlie George! Oh, what a fabulous goal by George! And Arsenal have won, and they've done the double. David O'Leary first joined us as a young boy from over from Ireland. Arsenal did very well at that particular time, uh, getting three outstanding youngsters from Ireland, uh, Liam Brady, Frank Stapleton, and also David. Uh, three tremendous signings who went on to have great careers with Arsenal. When I joined the club three years ago, I thought David actually was going backward a little bit. When he was in his early 20s, I thought he was probably going to be the finest centre half in Europe. A great pace, tall and elegant, and he just looked the part. But I thought he lost his way a little bit for a few years. Whether it was his hunger, uh, I don't know. And I had a good chat with David when I first came to the club. And I says to him that, uh, as far as I was concerned, his career stood still and it was up to him. And uh, to be fair, he responded tremendously well. He's a tremendous ambassador, not only for Arsenal, but for the game of football. Uh, he has a bit of dignity about him, conducts himself very well. Uh, and without question, David is, uh, is in contention for one of the, one of the sports to centre back. There's Waddle, has possession for Spurs. And a lovely ball for Stewart, over the head of the defenders, but O'Leary showed all his experience to get back and cover. Tony Adams. When I first arrived, um, I put him straight in the team at 19. He was capped for England at 19. Uh, still think he will be an England regular. He's going through an indifferent spell. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, the Arsenal has always given his best. When I made him captain, I thought he was a little bit young at the time. But he's handled all the pressures very well. And there was nobody more pleased uh, after receiving some criticism. Uh, there was nobody more pleased than myself when Tony Adams went up to receive the championship trophy at Anfield. One of Tony's strengths uh, is at set pieces, both corner kicks and free kicks. And he's been invaluable uh, for the last three years anyway uh, for Arsenal at set pieces. And his goal scoring record is very good, not only for Arsenal, but also for England. Again, a very difficult choice, uh, but I picked Frank McClintock for his leadership, his will to win, his never said I attitude, uh, and a tremendous leader and captain on the pitch. And alongside Frank, it was a difficult decision, but I'd go for David O'Leary, just in front of Peter Simpson, with David's pace helping out Frank at the back. So, at centre-back, Frank McClintock, one of Arsenal's greatest captains, mastermind on the field during those glittering days of 1971. And alongside him, David O'Leary. His Arsenal career started in 1975. Fourteen seasons later, he picked up that deserved championship medal. Now we come to the right side of midfield. Outside right, some would call them. Among them, Joe Hume from the 1930s, Freddie Cox and David Rowcastle. Joe Hume 
going back to the 30s again, uh, the great team in that decade, was a flying right winger, and he made up a great partnership with Boy Barson on the left wing. Joe had a tremendous career with Arsenal and also England, and went on to have a further outstanding career in journalism. Again, I didn't see Joe, so I've just got to pick him on reputation and also for the trophies he achieved during the 30s. Also in the 30s was Alf Kirshen. Again, um, not seen any clips at all of Alf, so I'll just have to go on reputation alone uh, and talking to older Arsenal fans. After four minutes, a pass from Kirchen gave Lewis a chance to open the score, and he took it. Going into the 50s, Freddie Cox. Freddie was famous for this wonder goal that he scored at Tottenham Hotspur against Chelsea to put Arsenal through to the cup final, direct from the corner kick. He then played his role uh, in the cup final, beating Liverpool again 2-0. Then Danny Clapton, another one of the 50s, with a great reputation, and he also has got in contention for the right-wing spot. David Rocastle was a youngster when I first joined the club as manager. He was probably not ready for the first team when I first came, but I took a chance, put him in, in the team, and his response was magnificent. David is, can get you out of your seat with some of his ball skills and some of his great goals. Uh, one especially against me, who actually took beat a few players and crashed it in. And there was another one at Anfield, tremendous angle shot from the edge of the box. David can only get better, and I'm sure going to make a big, big impact, not only in English football, but international football. One of the best performances of David Brocastle's uh, early career was against Spurs at White Hart Lane in the semi-final of the Kings Cup. David had a magnificent match and capped it all by getting the winning goal if he put his feet around it. Up towards Merson. Rowcastle outside him. Plenty up for Arsenal now. David Rowcastle. Still Rowcastle. Fantastic goal. Only straight to Rowcastle, the chance is on. The goal is there for David Rowcastle. And he's got Rowcastle in support. A lovely ball played by Groves for Rowcastle. And he's made sure this time. Steve Williams. Williams again, who's in tremendous form. Rowcastle now on the far side for Arsenal. 1-1! Castle makes it 1-1. That was a difficult one between two players. Obviously, Joe Hume, who I haven't seen. Uh, in fact, I haven't actually seen any clips of him. But a tremendous reputation uh, and was told by a lot of people that he, he would be the best. But I've plumped for David Rowcastle. Uh, he's not only had three outstanding seasons for Arsenal and got in the England team when he was 21, but I think the best has still got to come out of David Rowcastle yet. Uh, and I'm sure there won't be many people arguing with me with David Rowcastle's choice. So, David Rowcastle, still in his early 20s, a dazzling player with no doubt his best days yet to come in an Arsenal shirt. He gets the place wide on the right. Now the left side of midfield, Cliff Bastin, Boy Bastin they used to call him, Dennis Compton, Don Roper, George Armstrong, Graham Ricks and Brian Marwood. Cliff Bastin, again going back to the 1930s, on reputation, was an outstanding player. Boy Baston was his nickname, and he actually achieved nearly all the honours in the game before he was 21. A tremendous achievement. Jumping from Baston, we got to get into the late 40s and early 50s with Dennis Compton. Dennis, who was also an outstanding cricketer, had a great career at Arsenal, and was unfortunate not to get any international honours. Also, a player in that era who played on the left side of the pitch was Don Roper. Another one to achieve quite a bit of success with Arsenal. We then go back to the 70-71 team again. George Armstrong. As far as I'm concerned, an unsung hero. Tremendous player, a great appetite, and was one of the best players without doubt of that famous 70-71 team. 
Jordy could play on the right wing and on the left, uh, having great success in both legs. He's never a great goal scorer, Jordy. He always provides lots of goals to people like Kennedy, Radford, and also myself. So I would think Jordy's got a very, very good chance to get the left on the spot. Bradford, trying to flick it on, Armstrong, there it is, number two by George Armstrong. Robertson trying his luck on the far side, finding Graham. Radford trying to give Hind the slip, and he may well have done so. Robertson, missed the chance, Armstrong, George Armstrong, number one. Obviously badly needing a win to lift their morale a little bit. In the same way that Arsenal are, surprisingly, finding themselves at 14th in the first division to Palace's 18th. Here's McNabb putting it across. Radford in! And there it is by Radford! Armstrong with the corner for Arsenal. And Radford again getting in. Flick in a goal! Off Radford! His second goal of the game and Arsenal's third. Radford going in again, and again, and now George Graham. A little one-two, a chance for Graham. Oh, a magnificent goal by Graham. What a superb goal by Graham. George Graham, and Armstrong gone sprinting in. Beautiful play by Arsenal. Oh, and a magnificent goal by Radford. Oh, a tremendous goal. What a magnificent ball there by Graham to get Armstrong away and that brave, brave diving header by Radford. Graham Ricks took over from George. The dream was very, very similar player to Liam Brady. Tremendous left foot. At times looked unbelievable. It probably didn't reach its potential that he first showed when he first got in the team. It was sad because Graham not only was a great student of the game, but a very talented player, who arguably should have done a lot better for the talent that he had. Ten there from Woodcock to Ricks. What a fine goal from Graham Ricks. That left foot so accurate. Arsenal's corner quickly taken. Luton caught out a little bit there. Rick's trying it in! Rick's wriggling all the way through. He's gone all the way. And that's number three for Graham Ricks. On the Arsenal bench as well as in the Arsenal goal. They're on their feet applauding him. Brian Marwood, who joined us from Sheffield Wednesday, had an inspirational first six months of the season. He was arguably our best player and did so well they get in the international setup. And Brian had some tremendous goals, not only scoring them, but also making goals. Rocastle. Still Rocastle. Smith Marwood. And he deserves to be on the score sheet. Rokasa. Here's Dixon. Smith at the near post. Hayes. Marwood. 3-0. What a day for him. Not for Bobby Mims. Beating the gun. Smith. And Marwood. A wonderful strike. Richardson who got it away for Arsenal. Here's Winterburn. And Marwood in there. Marwood now. Will it be four? It is indeed a brilliant goal by Brian Marwood. He runs towards the Arsenal fans. And what a hero of theirs he's become. 
again, a very difficult decision between the, the old and the new. Similar problem that I had on the right wing with Joe Hume and David Rocastle arises here again between Cliff Baston and George Armstrong. Having played with Geordie, I've got to go along and sort of select Geordie for the outside left position. So, George Armstrong, a popular choice, an Arsenal player for 15 years, some 500 league appearances and never known to give anything other than his best. The contenders for the right-back place in this greatest ever Arsenal side, Tom Parker and George Mayle, both from the 30s, Laurie Scott, Don Howe and Pat Rice. Tom Parker was the captain and right back in Herbert Chapman's great side of the 30s. Indeed, he led out the team at Wembley against Huddersfield in 1930 and led Arsenal to a victory that got the ball rolling. I never saw him play, of course, but old-timers tell me that he was a fine leader and a great fullback. George Mayle took over from Tom Parker in the early 30s and he had a long and distinguished career and through to 1948, gaining quite a few international caps and formed a tremendous partnership uh, with Eddie Hapgood. Laurie Scott took over from George Mayle uh, after the Second World War and he actually went on to uh, another outstanding career, uh, both with Arsenal and also got 17 caps playing for England and Laurie was in uh, another championship side. Don Howe, my old coach, when we won the, the, the double in 70-71, Don probably had the best of his career at West Bromwich Albion and was already a regular in the international team. Probably came to Arsenal when he was in the autumn of his career, uh, and unfortunately got a very bad uh, broken leg, which really finished him here, and then started on his new career as an outstanding coach, and one of the best coaches uh, I've worked with. Pat Rice, who I played with uh, again in the 71 uh, championship side. Pat, to me, was self-made player, uh, I've never seen somebody so determined to become a player. Uh, we used to finish playing, uh, training in the mornings. Pat would come back in the afternoons to, to Highbury and practice uh, with a ball against a wall. Uh, there was nobody you could hold up to, to, to young children, to sort of say the hard work uh, made Pat Rice a player. Rocking again with a corner, floated in again, and Robson with a header, kicked off the line by Pat Rice. Pat actually went on to captain Arsenal and a lot of very successful cup ties and appeared at Wembley, I think, in five FA Cup finals, uh, captaining the side about three times. Three seasons now as the captain and the proudest moment in his career because Arsenal make up for last year's defeat and take the cup to Highbury. in defence. Ross chipping it in there. Oh, and it's a goal by Rice! Well, they fought at that point. If they can hold on to this. Tarantini in there. Having a tussle with Walford. And Rick's playing it in. And this might come for Price. It might come for Rice. And hey! for Pat Rice out as far as Kelly and now for McNabb turn in again and Rice yes Pat Rice uh, that's been a very close one again not having seen uh, Parker uh, or George Mayo I would just say Laurie Scott just uh, wins the right back spot Laurie Scott then, the reliable member of the side that won the championship in 1948, good enough to win 17 caps for England as well. He's the right-back choice. Now the left-back contenders, among them the immaculate Eddie Hapgood from the 1930s, Wally Barnes, Bob McNabb and Kenny Sansom. Eddie Hapgood was probably one of the best left-backs, not only for Arsenal but for, and it, for England, over a long spell. He first uh, got into the Arsenal side in the late 20s. He went right through all the 30s and up to the Second World War. Uh, I think he had about 30 caps for England. 
again, I didn't see him. Uh, I would love to have seen him because apparently he was an immaculate player, classy. Um, and he formed a tremendous partnership with George Mayo, uh, which is still famous today. Wally Barnes, who took over from Eddie Hapgood, had a very distinguished career, not only with Arsenal, but gained many, many caps for Wales. Funnily enough, Wally has been remembered most of all for getting injured in the cup final. Uh, and unfortunately, in those days, there was no substitutes. So uh, Arsenal lost that one. It's quite amazing how he's famous for that defeat at Wembley against Newcastle. And we mustn't forget Lionel Smith, a contemporary of Wally Barnes, and he also gets capped six times for England. Again, going back to my old side in 70-71, uh, Bob McNabb. Bob was a tremendous defender. I uh, loved pushing forward, but probably didn't have the qualities going forward that he had defensively. Again, Bob actually made the World Cup, but uh, he was finally eliminated out of the 40 and was sent back from Mexico and then made quite a name for himself as one of the panellists on television many years ago. But Bob was a very good professional, tremendous attitude, um, and he would definitely be in the reckoning for the left back spot. Sammy Nelson formed a tremendous partnership with Pat Rice, not only for the Arsenal team, but also for the Northern Ireland team, and picked up many, many caps. Sammy had a wonderful left foot, and probably one of the funniest people I've ever been involved with in football. And here's Armstrong. Arsenal now in a position to dictate terms here, with Birmingham down to ten men. Brady putting it across for Sammy Nelson, he's hitting it! Yes, Kenny Samson. First played with Kenny when he was only 17 at Crystal Palace. And then he got his big move to join Arsenal. To me, Kenny was the best left back in England for a decade. And that proved the point because he's the most capped Arsenal player ever. Uh, and justifiably so. Tremendous going forward. Great left foot. Uh, good attitude. Um, and yes, uh, definitely contender for the left back spot. Chamberlain against tired defenders. And it's reached Sansom. 46 times Kenny Sansom's played for England. And Oli Hootenen is the first goalkeeper he's beaten. This was a very difficult one because I was trying to visualise Hapgood and all the books that I've read and the people I've spoken to saying what a magnificent player he was. So unfortunately, I didn't see him. But uh, with I've got no hesitation, I would definitely pick Kenny Sampson, who, I repeat, he was definitely the best left back in England for over 10 years. So, George's choice, Kenny Sampson. He made the left back spot his own when he joined from Crystal Palace in 1980 until he left almost nine years later. Two centre midfield places to be chosen for this greatest ever Arsenal eleven. The legendary Alex James is among the candidates, Wolf Copping and Joe Mercer too. And then we must not forget Jimmy Logie, Alan Ball and Liam Brady. What a selection problem for George Graham. Charlie Buchan, who was Herbert Chapman's first signing for Arsenal in the late 1920s, alongside David Jack, Alex James, and Wolf Copping. Tremendous players with lots of talent and drive from midfield in the famous decade in the 30s. Alex James was also a cartoonist dream with his long baggy shorts uh, and being so small in stature. It's very sad really that uh, the great players from the 30s, there wasn't enough snippets on film of them. But luckily we've got one with Herbert Chapman and Tom Whittaker introducing the famous team from the 30s. 
Alec James, next. We Alec is called. Plays inside left. Jack Lambert. I'll smile and send her forward. From the famous four of the 30s, we now jump to another famous four of the late 40s and early 50s. Namely, Joe Mercer, Archie McCauley, Jimmy Logie, and Alex Forbes. Jimmy Logie was very, very similar in stature and ability to the famous 30s man, Alex James. Jimmy Logie, along with Alex James, was the midfield general of the team. Great pass of the ball, setting up lots of goals and very famous goals too. And an exquisite pass coming up from Jimmy Logie there, setting up a goal for Reg Lewis in the 1950 Cup Final. Joe Mercer, another great captain, joined Arsenal in the autumn of his career after having a great spell with Everton. What was amazing about Joe in his Arsenal days was just he travelled down from Ellesmere Port, working all week in his small grocer shop and then turning out in packed stadiums all over the country. Tremendous captain, uh, tremendous player, and uh, also was a successful manager. Uh, my first manager at Aston Villa, actually. The highlight of Joe's Arsenal career was unquestionably the lifting of the FA Trophy in the 1950 Cup Final. A few years later, unfortunately, he broke his leg, and uh, that more or less finished his career in professional football. George Easton joined Arsenal from Newcastle. Unfortunately for George, it wasn't a successful time in the Arsenal history. Peter Story was very, very quiet off the pitch, but showed his great nerve when in the semi-final against Stoke City at Hillsborough, scored two goals. The second one, apparently in extra time. It just shows the quality and the ice cool nerve he had to convert that penalty to take us to a replay at Villa Park. So it's... Arsenal's throw with uh, George Armstrong. Over the head of Skeels to Kennedy. Now Radford and Graham leaping at that far side. And Storey to Hamid! And a goal! You've got to give it to Storey! And Arsenal back in it! We've now played 45 seconds of injury time as Armstrong takes this last gasp corner for the Arsenal. Everybody up and heading off the line! Was it a penalty? It's a penalty, because it was pushed off the line by Mahoney. And so Arsenal, in the very last seconds, have a penalty. Story is the man with the terrible responsibility. Story, who has scored in four penalties this season, now faces Gordon Banks the number one goalkeeper in the world and there are Arsenal players who dare not watch Storey versus Banks Wembley at stake and he's done it Storey has equalised 2-2 and you cannot get a more dramatic semi-final than this Arsenal reprieve with almost the very last kick after the breakup the famous 70-71 team, young Liam Brady came into the side and showed then, as a youngster, the quality pair they eventually did become. Again, Liam fits into the mould with Jimmy Logie, Alex James, setting up the moves, being the puppet master in midfield, pulling all the strings. Great left foot and tremendous vision. He's again finding Brady. Brady switching the point of that beautifully, and you can see the advantage of it by how much space there is here for Nelson and for Ricks. Brady. I can't go on doing that. I mean, that was inch perfect the game from about 50 yards. Thomas, they've given it away. In fact, they have given it away. A little touch coming to Price. Brady trying to get in there. Might still get in there. Brady. That's a beautiful goal. Stapleton, and Story. Early once more, Simpson helping it on its way, Brady! Yes, Liam Brady! Right on half-time! Paul Hart, oh, he's got caught in possession there. 
Here are Arsenal marauding away again with McDonald and Brady linking up well. Stapleton's up there. McDonald's looking for it too. timing getting it in the air now Brady with Makari snapping at him I wonder if that's going to be the sort of thing we shall see for 90 minutes that Makari will need to stick close to Brady when he's in the midfield there Price going right in there and turning it back and a goal and it's going to be well either Talbot or Sunderland here's Brady Going all the way, can he find the shot or the cross? There's the little cross coming in, and that's number two by Stapleton. Brady made it, and he was in brilliant cup final form that day, but Manchester United struck back to make it 2-2. However, Brady then helped set up the winning Arsenal goal. What an amazing turnabout. And the scenes on the two benches, well, I've never heard of. The despair on the face of Don Howe and uh, Terry Neal. Well, wait a moment. It's there by Sunderland. And they're back in the lead again. And they're off the bench once more. What an amazing cup final. Also at that time, and in the same side, Alan Ball joined Arsenal after having a great career at Everton. Alan's ability speaks for itself, being capped so many times for England. And Alan's assets, that is his wonderful attitude to the game, never say die. I would never give up. And story up there. Now Brady. Chance to cross in towards Kid Played back for Armstrong. Oh, hit now. Ball. Yes. Ball. One man to Arsenal. He finds Joe Redmond out on the side for so long, but back to good effect now. Oh, Armstrong in the echo. Ball with a shot. Two midfield players is without question the most difficult decision I've had to make. With such a wealth of talent, different types of players, all into, nearly all international players, but I finally plumped for Alec James on the right side of midfield and Liam Brady on the left. A wonderful balance. The legendary Alex James then, in those glittering 30s, nobody say the old-timers showed more style and skill than we Alex, and it would be unthinkable to have the greatest ever Arsenal team without him. And what a mouth-watering prospect to have Liam Brady teamed up alongside him. Liam to Arsenal fans during those years between 1973 and 79 meant as much as Alex had done 40 years earlier. Now, this is George Graham's greatest ever Arsenal team. Jack Kelsey in goal. A back four of Laurie Scott, Frank McClintock, David O'Leary and Kenny Sansom. In the midfield, David Rowcastle, Alex James, Liam Brady and George Armstrong. And then the two strikers, John Radford and Ted Drake. And Highbury, I've no doubt, will be packed every week to see them play. But George is also allowed five substitutes for this greatest ever Arsenal eleven. The five substitutes would be Wilson in goal, Hapgood, defender, Baston, the winger, Logie, central midfield player, and Malcolm McDonald, the striker. But a great side needs a great manager, so who would the manager be? It's not a difficult one, really. There's only four managers apart from myself who won the championship. And it was Chapman, George Allison, Tom Whitaker, and Bertie May. I know Bertie very well, and he did tremendous as a manager. The only manager that won the double. I think you've really got to plump for Herbert Chapman. He was the one that started the ball rolling. 1930 was the first time they won a trophy, the FA Cup. And then they went on in that decade to win championship after championship and the FA Cups. And really start the Arsenal tradition. Set standards for the later teams in later years. And even today, there's a bronze bust of Herbert Chapman in the Highbury Hall. And I think you would really enjoy the team that I've just selected. So, a final look then at George Graham's greatest ever Arsenal team. 
something, no doubt, for Gunners fans to savour, and plenty too for them to argue about.